Uh, thank you all for joining us today for today's program. My name is Rebecca Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the DC Preservation League. We are the citywide nonprofit organization founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic and built environment of Washington, DC through advocacy and education. With that, I'm so pleased to start our program today to discuss the 75% draft document for the Women's Suffrage Context Study. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to Kim Elliott with the DC Historic Preservation Office, who will tell you a little bit more about the context study and how it meets the goals of the Historic Preservation Program. Kim? Great, thanks, Rebecca. Um, my name is Kim Elliott, and I am the lead uh, project lead from the DC Office of Planning on this project. Um, we are thrilled to have been awarded this grant from um, the National Park Service's Underrepresented Community Grant Program, which is to study DC women's history and suffrage. Um, and some of the um, elements of this uh, historic context study will meet our goals for our DC historic preser uh, preservation plan that will be coming out um, next year. Um, and some of these goals include uh, completing the city survey towards understanding a complete and diverse heritage of the city, exploring new perspectives and broadening public awareness of the DC historic um, sites, designating some significant properties. And one of the goals of this study is to identify two new landmarks and to also broaden the and amend two of the existing um, historic sites. And also telling community stories is another goal. And also speaking out for preservation, increasing the public advocacy for historic preservation and cultural heritage programs. And so we look forward to the women's suffrage movement um, and women's history and meeting those goals. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, acknowledge the sponsor of this document, the financial sponsor, which this program has received federal financial assistance for the identification, protection, and or rehabilitation of historic properties and cultural resources in the District of Columbia. Under Title uh, VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the U.S. Department of the Interior prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, or disability in its federally assisted programs. Uh, in addition, this, type, this publication has been financed in part with federal funds from the U.S. Department of the Interior National Park Service. However, the contents and opinions contained in this publication do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of the U.S. Department of Interior, nor does the mention of trade names or commercial products constitute endorsement or recommendations by the U.S. Department of Interior. So with those housekeeping notes, I'd like to turn it over to the consultant, Quinn Evans Architect, who will introduce themselves and introduce you to this project and the 75% submittal. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rebecca and uh, Kim. Good evening, uh, my name is Ruth Mills. Uh, welcome to everybody. I am the senior historian at Quinn Evans. Um, we have a short presentation for you this evening, and if you can go to the next slide. Thank you, Nikita. Um, we have a short presentation for you this evening that will introduce this project um, and provide an overview of the work that we're doing. First, we will introduce our team and describe the goals and activities that are included in this project. We'll then discuss the seven major themes around which the project is organized and our preliminary classification of the property types that are related to those themes. And then finally, we'll, we, will, we will provide a project timeline and outline the next steps in the project before opening the floor for questions and answers. Next slide, please. So we were very pleased to be selected for this project because it is closely related to two of our recently completed studies. Um, earlier this year, we completed a historic resource study for the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument here in DC. This document chronicled the history of the National Women's Party, its role in the passage of the Women's Suffrage Amendment, and its advocacy for women's rights after the 19th Amendment. We were also on the team for the DC Preservation League's previous project to document sites related to 20th century African American civil rights in DC. And so this study really feels like a natural follow up to both of those efforts. To introduce ourselves, we are Quinn Evans. We are a DC based planning and design firm that specializes in historic preservation. Our team for this project includes Patty Babin, who is serving as project manager and lead historian. 
myself, Ruth Mills, also a historian and supporting Patty in research and writing, and Nikita Reed, historical architect, who is leading the inventory and assessment of buildings and sites. Um, and as Rebecca uh, noted, this project is funded by a grant from the National Park Service facilitated through the DC Preservation League and the DC Historic Preservation Office with support from the Mayor's Office on Women's Policy and Initiatives and the District of Columbia Office of Planning. So during the rest of this presentation, we will be turning off our video and our cameras to save bandwidth. And we, of course, will turn them back on when we reach the question and answer portion. If I can actually get to my stuff. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so this project um, will identify and document historic resources that are associated with the women's suffrage movement in Washington, DC. Can you go to the next slide, please? So the goals of the project are to identify the critical themes of the women's suffrage movement within the District of Columbia, to organize a timeline of events, to name the critical players in the movement, and to establish a preliminary list of places that define this time in history. The time period that's covered by this study is from 1848, which is the date of the Seneca Falls Convention that initiated the women's suffrage movement to 1973. So although the 19th Amendment granted women's suffrage and passed in 1920, this longer period of time was selected to document the difficulties that some women faced in exercising the right to vote after the 19th Amendment, and also to capture women's activities in the effort uh, to pass voting rights in the District of Columbia, specifically through the passage of the DC Home Rule Act in 1973, which closes out the period. And I also wanna note that this study um, is expected to serve as a framework for future research and documentation. So it's not intended to be a comprehensive history of women's rights during the period, um, we also know that while women's suffrage overlaps with other studies and movements such as civil rights, LGBTQ rights, and others, this study was specifically limited to women's suffrage related contexts. Um, additionally, we also want to note that women, um, especially women of color and gender nonconforming women, have historically been under underrepresented in historic documentation. So while this study is, is um, planning to incorporate recent research, we also need to acknowledge that further primary research will be required in the future. And, and indeed, we hope that this, that this project um, um, brings about some more of that research. Next slide, please. So the project activities related to this are um, um, the context study uh, on the history of the women's suffrage movement and related efforts of women to, grant, to gain equal rights in Washington, DC. Um, and that includes both the historic themes that we'll talk about and the associated, associated property types. Um, it will also provide a preliminary inventory of significant sites that are eligible for historic designation at the state and national level. Um, and again, we, this is gonna be preliminary. We are hoping that this will bring out um, a lot of sites that are perhaps not as well known. Um, we will be throughout this process consulting with the DC Preservation League and the DC uh, Historic Preservation Office. Uh, we will be holding community outreach events of which this is the first major one. And then at the end of the project, we will be presenting the completed context study to the DC Historic Preservation Review Board. Um, and then, oh yes, <laughs> sorry. So if the, those of you who are curious, the, the image on the right is Alice Paul, who is unfurling the ratification banner um, on the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. And she's standing on the balcony of 14 Jackson Place which was at the time the National Women's Party headquarters. Next slide, please. So in the next portion of the presentation, we'll be providing a brief overview of those seven themes um, that were established for women's suffrage and the topics that are covered in each theme. Next slide. Theme one is a brief history of the women's suffrage movement in the United States. And we are providing this in order to place events in DC within their larger historical context. It begins with the Seneca Falls, New York Convention in 1848 that kicked off the women's suffrage movement. And that's represented on the left by the original newspaper announcement of the convention in 1848. Following the Civil War, the women's suffrage movement split over the question of including women in the proposed 15th Amendment, which in the end extended the franchise only to black men. Although the two major suffrage organizations reunited in 1890, it 
entered a, the, the movement um, entered a period known as the doldrums from 1890 to around 1910, when little real progress was made. The chapter ends by describing the revitalization of the movement in the 1910s and the final effort to pass the 19th Amendment, which was ratified in August 1920. And on the right is a photograph from the famous 1913 Women's Suffrage Parade, which was held in DC in March, just prior to the president's inauguration. Next slide, please. Theme two delves more deeply into the political strategy and tactics employed by members of the movement to achieve suffrage. There were two main approaches that were advocated by suffragists during this period, passing a federal amendment to the constitution or pursuing suffrage on a state by state basis. In the early 20th century, the second generation of suffragists coalesced around the federal amendment and the National Women's Party employed controversial tactics, including picketing the White House. And on the upper right corner, you see the first group of picketers in 1917 shown in front of Cameron House in early, in early 1917. This chapter also discusses the anti-suffrage movement, which emerged alongside the pro-suffrage forces in the late 19th century. And one of those organizations was the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, which moved its headquarters to DC in 1917. Next slide, please. Theme three describes the organizations that were involved in the women's suffrage movement. Many women's suffrage activities took place within the context of local and national organizations. So in this chapter, we are organizing these into two main categories, and that is national organizations that had their headquarters and or branches in DC and local organizations and some of the leaders of those organizations and their activities. Among the local organizations that included suffrage work was the Colored Women's League of Washington, D.C., founded in 1892. The image here shows members of the League on the front porch of Frederick Douglass's house in Anacostia around 1894. The League was reorganized as the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs in 1896. Next slide, please. Theme four on intersectionality acknowledges that women of color and gender non-conforming women experience the women's suffrage movement differently from white women. This section foregrounds the different goals, strategies, and experiences of these women, including black women, indigenous women, Asian American women, and gender non-conforming women. Some of the women highlighted in this chapter um, include Delta Sigma, Theta, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated of Howard University in the top photograph, Marie Botno Baldwin, a Metis Turtle Mountain Chippewa woman, Alice Dunbar Nelson, a black field organizer in the suffrage movement who also had intimate relationships with women, and Sofia Reyes de Vera, a Filipino woman who worked with the National American Women's Suffrage Association and later campaigned to extend women's suffrage to the Philippines. Um, I will now turn it over to Patty Babin to talk about the other themes. Thanks, Ruth. So theme five explores what happened after the 19th Amendment in terms of voting rights activism and other activities in the District of Columbia. So after more than 70 years of struggle to achieve the right to vote for women, the ratification of the 19th Amendment was a pivotal moment. Several months later, many were able to vote in the presidential election for the first time. However, for a large number of women, exercising their new right was far from easy. And so women had to overcome social norms that discouraged participation in voting. And without a central organizational structure in place, voting efforts were often left to individual states, local jurisdictions, political parties, and nonpartisan organizations, all which had different strategies. So the result was an uneven, um, registration process that led to different experiences for women depending on race, ethnicity, and geographic location. And women also faced literacy tests, poll taxes, deliberate me methods to keep Black, poor, and immigrant voters from participating in elections. And Black women also often faced outright intimidation and violence. So this chapter really explores how women's and organizations and women in general in DC supported um, working towards women to register for vote, to educate for vote, and to um, fight for women's rights in voting after the 19th Amendment. And many of the suffrage organizations reorganized to focus on these efforts. The chapter also recognizes that in the um, 50s and 60s, that this was 
often tied to the civil rights movement. And we had activism um, related to grassroots movements with like the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee and others that were working towards voting rights, especially in the South. So on the top left, you have Virginia Durr, who was the co-founder of the National Committee to Abolish the Poll Tax. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune on the upper right, who established the National Council of Negro Women, who really fought for voting rights and getting Black women in particular involved in the political process. And then below, um, one of the first headquarters of the League of Women Voters, um, who was the former National Association National American Women's Suffrage Association who reorganized after February 1920, right before the passage of the 19th Amendment. And this organization really fought um, to assist women in exercising their new constitutional rights and directing national, um, local organizations from their national headquarters. Next slide, please. So DC um, had their own suffrage movement and this chapter focuses specifically on women and the DC suffrage movement. As Ruth mentioned, one of the goals of this project was to include women's suffrage in relation to DC suffrage and home rule. Since after the ratification of the 19th amendment, both men and women residents of DC could not vote in any election. So this was as a result of the disenfranchisement of Washingtonians in 1801 when Congress passed the Organic Act and later in 1874, when the local elect elected government was replaced with a presidentially appointed commission. So district residents responded by creating local organizations, many of which were led by women to fight for DC suffrage, particularly national representation and home rule until the passage of the 1973 Home Rule Act. So women established and joined organizations and local chapters of national organizations that supported voting rights for DC residents. They organized demonstrations and parades and encouraged residents to register to vote. So one of the most prominent organizations was the DC uh, chapter of the League of Women Voters, which was also known as the Voteless League. And they were organized in April, 1920 and officially established in 1921. In the early 1920s, um, sorry, 1920th century, most organizations focus on federal suffrage and national representation. And then in the 1940s and 50s, many organizations focused on home rule. With the enactment of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Act, Rights Act in 65, it really helped propel the home rule movement and it became entrenched in the civil rights movement. So the photo on the right shows the DC chapter of the League of Women Voters um, trying to get DC residents out to register for vote for the 1964 election after the passage of the 23rd Amendment in 1961. On the upper left is Home Rule Day, a rally held in 1966 and organized by the Youth Organizations United. Um, below left is Polly Shackleton and members of the Democratic Central Committee who are marching down 14th Street towards the district building to register to vote in 1964. And on the lower left is Carol Sharp and Chloe Ann Beck of the Washington Home Rule Committee in 1959 who are picketing near the Capitol. Next slide, please. Finally, we have the women in the youth suffrage movement. Um, in this chapter, we wanted to recognize the passage of the 26th Amendment in 1971 and women's involvement in this movement. So when this was passed in 1971, it lowered the voting age from 21 to 18 and 10 million new voters were enfranchised. So historically interest in lowering the voting age generally increased during wartime. And in World War II, when more, more men and women were, sorry, excuse me, more young men were constricted into military service, the call came again for lowering the voting age and it became more pronounced. And the old, old enough to Fight old enough to vote mantra re-emerged in Congress and in pop culture in the 1960s as the US government sent more troops to Vietnam. And concurrently, teenagers growing involvement in political movements such as the push for civil rights, campus free speech and women's liberation really showcased the power of youth in directing cultural conversations in the US. So the majority of efforts in the DC were associated with this movement really took place in the late 60s and 70s and were primarily connected to organizational headquarters, lobbying efforts, and testimony in Congress. 
um, and also specific events. One was um, held in 1969 when the NAACP Youth and College Division sponsored a national youth mobilization conference in DC. And another organization, um, there are several organizations that were developed to help push the, the Vote 18 effort. And one was the National Education Association's Youth Franchise Coalition. And shown here is Pat Kiefer, who was a, a national organization, excuse me, national organizer for this group and went on to join Common Cause as a lobbyist in the early 70s. And Common Cause also focused on the passage and ratification of the 26th Amendment. Next slide, please. I'm kind of wrapping up this section, this was a quote that we found during our research that we really liked because it really seemed relevant to what we were studying. And it's from Ruth Havens, a suffragist and lawyer in 1901. And she's responding to um, a pamphlet on home rule and how women and people of color need to be included in this discussion. Um, At present, the district has no suffrage and no representation. When suffrage is granted, it will not be to a color nor a class to a sex. All right, well, thank you, Patty. So for the next portion of the talk, I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about the property types associated with the various people and themes that Ruth and Patty have just discussed. One of the things that we realized as we're doing the research and trying to identify the sites that would be appropriate for the different people associated with the movement was that we had to think about what types of sites they were, as well as were we looking for sites associated with where people lived or where people worked, and what did that look like depending upon the time frame that each person spent at a certain property. So the categories of property types that we've identified are strategy centers, demonstration centers, and then also properties associated with key persons. And these property types can range from organizational headquarters to residences, some churches, schools, government buildings, sites, and other structures. And as we were going through and looking at these different property types, we realized very quickly that there are multiple types of properties and that the women's suffrage movement did not happen in just one particular type of property or building type or architectural style. So there are um, smaller sites like row houses, like the Mary Ann Shad Carey House. There were larger um, residences and buildings like the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument. And then the, there were more grand DC houses, which was more on the single family scale, as well as additional smaller DC row houses, like the Dorothy Bolding Ferriby House or the Nettie Ottenberg House. But the building scale also got larger. So we were also looking at sites such as the Carnegie Library, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, the Cameron House, or Asbury United Methodist Church. So the buildings varied in scale widely. But in addition to the building types, there were also certain sites that had much prominence within the movement be it parade routes like up and down Pennsylvania Avenue or sites of gathering and protest like the Chevy Chase Circle, picketing outside the White House or even gathering at the Sylvan Theater on the National Mall. So throughout the, uh, throughout the research that we're doing, one of the goals of the project, as Ruth mentioned, is to be able to find and nominate sites that we could apply for additional landmarking on the National Register, or even just applying to the DC inventory. So as we're going through and deciding which sites to elevate, we'll be looking at the sites more closely, trying to pay potential or particular attention to sites that don't have as much documentation and aren't currently listed on the register. So the site search will continue. And I'll turn it over to Patty to talk about timeline and next steps. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Takeda. So this is just a quick project timeline to show you where we are in the project and then where we're going and what to expect. Um, today, of course, is our community presentation, one of two, and we have an opportunity to provide feedback on our 75% draft and Nikita will talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, we're submitting our final draft in the spring and then having another community presentation at the end of the project. And then in the fall, we will be presenting the project to the Historic Preservation Review Board. Um, and that will complete the study. 
And so many of you may have already seen the dashboard that's online through the Miro website. If you haven't, please check it out. You can either get to it through the link at the top, or if you want to get to it on your phone, you can scan this QR code. And we'll also put a link to it in the chat so you can get there directly from your computer. And so this is the dashboard that we're using to both accept feedback. If you click on the button in the middle, you can provide feedback or comments on the 75% draft or this presentation or anything else that you would like to talk about related to women's suffrage. Um, you also can suggest a site or a person if you have some additional research or some additional suggestions that you would like us to take a look at in research and uh, consider including into the study. Uh, and you also have the option to sign up for the mailing list so you can make sure that you'll hear about the next community outreach event and any other things pertaining to this project. And with that, uh, we would love to open it up for questions and answers and um, remember to put things in the Q&A or in the chat and we will answer what we can. Great, thank you all to the team at Quinn, Quinn Evans uh, for the presentation. And so we'll start off by seeing if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask. Uh, there was one question in the chat with regarding uh, the use of the word experience. Uh, as being referenced uh, when discussing the racism uh, that was that many black women face. So could you maybe discuss that a little bit more? Yeah, I, I can take that. And, and I think that we, this, it's not to, um, it's not an attempt to downplay um, that, that outright racism. Um, it's something that we, we talked about uh, fairly extensively in the Belmont Paul, um, um, historic resource study in relationship to the, um, the National Women's Party and the use of racist rhetoric and, and white supremacy as a strategy, which you know you, you very rightly point out. Um, I think we wanted to make sure that we were being all encompassing of, of, of um, women's, black women's experiences and their, their um, in, in a positive sense of the things that they were doing um, looking at the, for example, the Black Women's Club movement um, of the late 19th and early 20th century and the, the suffrage work that they were doing that was uh, very different in character and, and in some of the approaches that they had um, to what the white women's uh, organizations were doing. So that's, that's was the intent of the word experience, not to downplay that experience. Great, thank you, Ruth, for that explanation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nikita, could you maybe talk a little bit more about the uh, dashboard and how uh, we've had a couple of um, people have emailed DCPL about a little bit of confusion as to how they do things. So could you maybe talk a little bit further about how that information will be utilized in the study and how the best way to, to submit uh, information would be? Sure. Uh, so the when you, when you click on the link, um, just for clarity, you do have to click on the little button at the top right of the of the squares to be able to get to the forms. And so then the onus is not on whoever's submitting information to do the research. It's more so to let us know so that we can do the research and you know make sure that we're going through and vetting the information and trying to add more information to the context study. Uh, and so the idea is that the sites that people suggest will be evaluated by the team and then hopefully included into the study if it makes sense within the context of what we're looking at. And then um, in terms of the mailing list, um, if you sign up for it, then we'll be sure to include you on additional things coming through. And then the comments, we've added that button as well. So if you have any comments or additional suggestions for this, we can make sure to get that incorporated. Because as, as Ruth and Patty mentioned, this is going to be a framework study. We recognize that there's a lot more research that needs to be done. So we're trying to make sure that we are uh, creating a space to receive as much information as possible. Mm -hmm. And we very much encourage people to, you know, please give us some contact information so that we can follow up if we have any questions. Um, you know, if you mention somebody and we want to make sure that we, we get all the information that you have on that person or place. Certainly. And one of the things uh, with the period of significance on this particular document is that it runs up until home rule. Is that correct, Patty? Right. That's correct. And so there may be individuals that you all are aware of who could actually give us that we may in the future be able to interview for oral histories as we expand upon this project. Uh, DCPL views this as just a first step moving forward and telling the greater story 
of Washington, D.C. Uh, we're doing this not only with women's history, but Asian American studies, as well as uh, the Black Power document that we're working on currently as well. Kim, would you like to talk a little bit more about the Historic Preservation Office's role in this as well? Yes, I mean, we're, we're hoping that um, with this historic context study, we can identify a couple um, landmark sites that don't haven't told the full story and we can um, amend those uh, documents so that it, it has a fuller story, including the women's history and women's suffrage, and also hoping to nominate uh, two new landmark sites. So that, those are a couple of the goals we're hoping to get from this. And just for the audience who's not necessarily familiar with the process here in DC, the landmarking process uh, protects buildings uh, that are designated within the District of Columbia on that are listed in the DC inventory of historic sites uh, from demolition and also requires any changes to the building to be reviewed by the Historic Preservation Office and the Historic Preservation Review Board. Uh, the office uh, typically after they've reviewed it and the, the building or site has been deemed to be a landmark, the building is or site is then forwarded to the National Register for Inclusion uh, there as well. So uh, that's just generally the process that takes place here in Washington. So I'm looking to see if there are any other questions from individuals. I think we might have a little bit of a shy group tonight. <laughs> I was going to um, see if uh, the Quinn Evans team might share um, some of the lesser known people or sites that they've started to research with the project that um, that you're you know excited to dive into a little bit more and elevate in the study. So I actually went down, Patty knows this, I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole with the, with the anti-suffragists. Um, I found that to be kind of a little bit more interesting than I thought it would be. Um, and there's a great quote and it's too long to get right here, but, but um, you know, there was a, a, a um, the anti-suffrage group that had a meeting and the suffragists showed up to give them pamphlets. And, and the, the press, as the press is wont to do, tried to turn it into a cat fight basically. Um, you know, so this was probably, you know, early, early 1910s and, and the leader of the anti-suffragist, she wrote and said, Hey, we're friends. And, you know, this, this, um, rivalry that you're putting out is not, is not true. We respect each other's, um, points of view, even if we don't necessarily agree. So that was, I thought that was really interesting. Something that I had not, um, looked into as much. Thanks, Ruth. How about you, Patty? Have you done that? Say, to like, there's just been so many women that I then have written down, um, specifically on home rule and um, DC suffrage related, and just need to then dive back into them to learn a little bit more and find out where they lived. Because I find that's the challenge is, um, you know, finding a little bit more about these women in, in searching for them. If, if, get a lot of information, but then it's like the next step is like, okay, where did they live? And is that place still there? And is it something that we can recognize as um, being significant for them? Um, so I'm not thinking of a specific person. I think <laughs> they're all kind of mixed up in my head, but I'm, I'm really excited about that part of, of DC history. And, you know, I've been a DC resident for almost 20 years now. And so it's, it's something that I'm really enjoying researching and learning more about. It's such an important part of our, um, about our, our history and it's so relevant to today as well. Great, and how about you, Nikita? I know that you do a lot of the uh, architectural research. Yes, yeah, so I, I get the, the joy of looking at the buildings and trying to see, okay, is it still here? Is it still standing? Is it extant? What's the design? So I get to focus a little bit more on the building, um, but it's great to learn more about where these different women lived and even just learning more from home rule to the different women of color, because that is something that uh, I've been really excited to work with Patty and Ruth on as they've really been trying to figure out how do we find more of these underrepresented stories, having more conversations with other researchers in the city, trying to get a sense of how do we broaden the narrative. So that's really exciting. Mm 
And we have a question in the chat about how, what is the process for identifying and incorporating underrepresented stories? So women, uh, non-binary, BIPOC, um, people of color. So how, how, what's the process for identifying these individuals who may not have been uh, necessarily front and center in all of the history documentation? He's Ruth or Patty might be muted. Yeah, I mean, for for certain things that that we've been looking at, I know from there has been some studies done, more recent studies, um, especially on DC um, women of color, um, black women in particular, on voting, and that to me was a great starting point. And I also enjoy looking at, um, for me, for looking at just in terms of your newspapers, looking at both you know, Washington Post, Evening Star, but also the Afro-American and other historically black newspapers to see like different perspectives and seeing what different people were writing about. And I think that often comes to tell stories and brings forward other people that may not have been um, included in some of the mainstream stories. So that that are some of the methods that, um, that I'm finding helpful in telling some of these other stories. And when you are uh, discussing, so it's seventy-five percent complete. And what do you feel is missing from the document? And what do you, what further activities need to take place in order to complete the study to the hundred percent that we'll be presenting in the spring? I can start with that one. Um, so a lot of what's missing right now is the completed sites inventory. And so as the research is happening and trying to identify the sites, um, so there's still a lot of work that needs to happen on looking at the integrity of the sites, locating the sites, finding the ward, the ownership information, and uh, more of the site information. So we can really populate that list. Similarly to what we did for the African-American civil rights sites in DC for that context study, we ended up having a database of sites that was searchable and people could get to that had an icon of what the site looked like, where it was located, what ward, who's the owner, is it on the register and all that stuff. So there's a little bit more database and uh, data entry that needs to happen on the sites, at least for my part. <laughs> Yeah, and I would also say that, you know, it's, a, it's I think what we refer to as a 75% draft, um, you know, and, and that's just a way that we indicate that it's a rough draft and we expect that we would be getting feedback on it from the DC Preservation League, the Historic Preservation Office and other people who are reviewing it, um, as well as the public, so that we can further flesh out, um, you know, or, or provide information, that, you know, to answer questions that come up. I think in terms of sorry, I'm ahead, seeing another question about how are we defining significance um, with the sites, and that's another thing that's missing and going to be part of the next um, deliverable is really thinking about from a DC inventory and National Register standpoint, how to best define significance for this um, historic context and how can we, um, how could these properties be listed and under and under what significance. So a lot of that is very technical in terms of um, both listing a property on the in the DC inventory and in the National Register, and that is something that we will be developing, particularly as we start um, refining the historic context and also looking at the different property types. And maybe Kim, maybe you could talk a little bit about significance and what kind of defines significance in the DC inventory and. Uh, kind of what the Historic Preservation Office looks for. I know that the you know, significance and our kind of our criteria that we have for designation in DC and what those are, so to speak, and how they may apply to this document. Sure. Um, so uh, there are several different uh, criteria of significance. Uh, of building or site uh, might be considered significant because of its um, architectural integrity or it might be considered significant because of a specific event that happened in, in that building. So some of these row houses that um, the team was showing earlier, um, if, if that was a place where many women's suffragist meetings took place and planning for the march, for example, that would be um, make, make it possibly a, a rise to the level of significance. And then um, there are also, 
um, just other historical events happening um, that bring it to a level of significance. For example, Pennsylvania Avenue, which is already a recognized um, historic site national um, on the National Register. Um, but also it was the site of the Women's March in 1913. So that is, um, you know, a whole other layer of significance of that, uh, of the avenue and the starting point being at the Navy Memorial and the ending point with the big um, uh, presentation um, at, at the, um, the Treasury Building. So um, th those are things that we want to flesh out and amend some of these um, things that maybe already listed uh, as um, on the National Register, but really flesh out the story and, and share all of the other women's suffrage events and people and places that took place. And one thing too, Nikita, I think we've discussed this in the past is that while you're looking at buildings and sites that um, you're looking at whether or not they're still here or not, we are also recording uh, properties that are not extant, correct? Correct. And so one of the things that the research is and or, or, that they're finding in the research is that there are some buildings that don't exist anymore, but they we're still trying to document those and we'll still list them in the inventory because we recognize that those could still be starting off points for future layers of research for future um, researchers trying to uncover more information. So we're really not trying to edit out anything that we find that could potentially be significant. We're trying to tell the fuller story of the women's suffrage movement. So there'll be a lot of things in the context study that may not exist anymore, but they still had some sort of importance in the movement. It's the layering of history. And I think that if uh, for any of you that have ever read National Register documentation, there is um, in DC, our inventory started back in 1964, where a bunch of architects sat around a room and said, that's significant, and that's significant, and that's significant. Uh, there's no documentation on those things. And most of the time, it was about kind of older white men who designed really pretty buildings. And so what we've now gotten into is this, as Kim described, this information of layering in things like Pennsylvania Avenue or Lafayette Park or some of the different buildings around DC that are important, not only for things that happened 100 years ago, but happened 50 years ago. And so, um, Patty, could you talk a little bit about how the, the, the kind of end point of the document and why that was selected? with the uh, period of significance ending in home rule? Great, I think um, when we first started this study, we had a discussion about 73, because that maybe surprised us a little bit too. Um, when we think about women's suffrage, I think a lot of us think about 1920 as a, obviously a very pivotal point. And then of course the decades after um, it related to, to voting rights and through the Voting Rights Act. but. 73 to, for us when we had that initial talk was really, you know, home rule was such an important part of the city. And we recognized that this wasn't just women who were, it wasn't only women who were working, it was, it was all residents of the city, but we wanted to pull out those stories about women and their involvement in DC specific suffrage and home rule. Um, and I know I'm finding as we're writing this document that, um, that that could be a whole study on its own. It's such a fascinating and important topic. And there's so many organizations that were involved over the years and getting um, working towards DC suffrage and home rule. And of course with DC statehood, which we didn't even um, really get into since it was you know started at, the, at that period and kind of has continued. So um, yeah, I think that that's definitely something we will recognize as for a future in depth study um, with more, more information. Uh, I did see a comment in here about the study that I referenced. Um, one recent study that I really enjoyed um, reading about and, and was a good starting point for me about the 26th Amendment was, um, it's by May C. Quinn, Black Women and Girls and the 26th Amendment, Constitutional Connections, Activist Intersections and the First Wave Youth Suffrage Movement. That, that was in 2020. Um, that was a really interesting, um, article that really put into perspective um, the activism there regarding the 26th Amendment. And then the other book, we just had it, um, it was a 19, sorry, 2018 book 
um, by Mary Elizabeth Murphy, Jim Crow Capital, Women in Black Freedom Struggles in Washington, DC, 1920 to 1945, that focuses on uh, pre-World War II activism um, in DC. Great, thank you. And then I think maybe we can just wrap up with this final question from uh, the Q&A, which is what's the most exciting part of this process for each of us? And I think I can speak for DCPL. We you know, have worked, this is our 50th anniversary. We're really excited. We've been responsible for the nomination of thousands of buildings within historic districts and individual landmarks in DC. And um, as a, you know, so primarily female staff, uh, with the exception of our very capable Zach Burt community outreach person. But uh, you know, this is a very heavily women-focused field. And so I think uh, telling uh, more stories in the District of Columbia about uh, women is very important to the Preservation League as we move forward, as well as telling stories of other underrepresented communities as well. How about you, Ruth? Um, yeah, you know, and I think I kind of want to bring it back to that whole question of significance that you were talking about. And I, I think that, you know, we've seen this with the civil rights sites um, and, and we're seeing it with the with women and women of color and not gender nonconforming women that that, you know, there's a lot of these sites are are unknown. A lot of them are, um, you know, very vulnerable to because they're not valued because women's history has not been valued or you know black people's history has not been valued um and so the the chance to kind of redefine i think what is significant and what we consider significant and to to acknowledge these places that a lot of people don't know about is is very exciting for me how about you nikita yeah so for me it's been two parts so it's been both being able to expand the narrative of women's suffrage, because I know for a lot of people, they think women's suffrage ends with the 19th Amendment, but really that's, you know, in essence gave white women the right to vote. So being able to expand the narrative to tell the story for black women, women of color, uh, and like, and just being able to tell more of a fuller story has been exciting. But then also on the building side, really seeing the sites that where history happened and recognizing that a lot of them are just regular regular sites or um, and not necessarily the big grand buildings and so it's been really exciting to remember the fact that history happens everywhere and it's not just in the big buildings that are the monuments that have been memorialized for decades there's really a lot more grassroots things that happen in smaller buildings as we say this is where the magic happens uh -huh. so to speak exactly. <laughs> how about you patty <laughs> Oh, to go last then, <laughs> it's hard. Um, but yeah, just to echo what Nikita and Bruce said, you know, working a lot on, you know, the Belmont Paul study before, which was really interesting and really great to work on, but really focusing then on that particular organization and which has, which has been the forefront of so much of the history understandably, but then to see from different perspectives, others that are involved and really to pull that story full circle altogether to see a more inclusive and holistic sto story, I think has been exciting because it really plays off all of the things um, together. And, and then of course, then finding those sites, it's almost like sleuthing, like let's find these sites that are out there that we didn't know about. And, you know, like we said, they're vulnerable. Some of them have been demolished. Some of them might not exist. So, you know, it's really crucial for us to find these sites and identify them and, and hopefully recognize them for for their importance before we, you know, I hate to use the word before it's too late, but before they might not be um, available to us to do so. Definitely, and Kim, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you volunteered for this in your office, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> this is a topic I'm very passionate about. <laughs> um, but uh, I think similar to what Nikita was saying, um, something I've been enjoying while reading the draft and just along the way doing some research myself um, is you know, recognizing some of the smaller stories or lesser known people that we don't get to hear as much about um, in the big you know, museum retrospectives about the, the, um, the, the 100 year anniversary, as you said, which wasn't for all really voting for all women, but, learning some more about some of the lesser known buildings and people um, and just realizing like these are people in our neighborhood like it's the house you walk or down the street and pass or it's this high school where this suffragist taught 
um, or this other hall where they had their meetings and planned the march, et cetera. And so that's been really fascinating to me to kind of pull out those stories and learn more about that. Great. Uh, well, with that, I think that we'll just wrap things up tonight, unless you have anything else you all would like to say before we do so. Anything else? Okay, great. Well, for the attendees, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, if you signed up for this program, you did receive the 75% document. It is also can be found in the link that Nikita put in the chat box. Uh, we will send you a note uh, tomorrow, a follow-up with the 75% document and also a link to the Miro site as well. And so we look forward to your comments. We are asking that you do provide comments uh, by October 14th so that they can be uh, looked at, digested. If we need to contact you, we can uh, moving forward. Uh, this document is also reviewed not only by DCPL and the Historic Preservation Office, but also by the National Park Service to give feedback to Quinn Evans uh, on how it takes form into its uh, final components. So with that, thank you all so much. And thank you to Quinn Evans for joining us tonight and uh, Kim from the Historic Preservation Office. And have a good evening and stay dry. <laughs>